Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and if everything is going to plan today, we will see the launch of NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 later today. TESS is the next step in NASA's Exoplanet Survey. So Kepler was their previous one. It launched uh, many years ago and it stared at a small section of the sky for many, many months at a time. Instead, TESS is going to stare at a, the whole sky over, over the next couple of years. So it will look for shorter period objects, but it will still uh, it will cover a much larger area of the sky. And so we'll hopefully find many, many more candidates. There's one other interesting difference in that Kepler was a Discovery class mission which has a budget of something like 450 million dollars whereas TESS is a an Explorer class mission which means that it only has about 200 million dollars to play with and 80 million of that is going into the launch on the Falcon 9. Incidentally, it's worth looking at TESS inside the fairings on the Falcon 9. For the Falcon 9, one size fairings fit all. That means that this uh, TESS has a lot of room to stretch its legs inside a rather cavernous fairing that is you know, able to accommodate things as large as a city bus, as, say, Hispasat uh, showed us lately. Anyway, the real thing that I'm fascinated by with TESS is the mission design that went into picking the orbit that it's going to be on. So many spacecraft launch into low Earth orbit, but that wouldn't work for TESS because it needed to look at the same area of sky for a long period of time. Kepler was launched into deep space, but doing that, that means you need to have a bigger antenna and you need to spend more time talking with the, the deep space network. So TESS is going to stay in orbit of the Earth, but it's going to be far enough away from the Earth that it doesn't have to worry about the Earth eclipsing it. It has to be close enough in that the Moon doesn't mess up its orbit from a stability standpoint. And furthermore, it has to be outside the Van Allen belts. But most of all, it has to do all this while being as cheap as possible. And one of the things that can cost money is engines, upper stage kit, uh, kick motors, uh, anything. So they are going to apparently budget 200 meters per second of delta V for their entire orbital insertion. And it is a really interesting piece of astrodynamics as to how they get to their final stable orbit. So with, uh, with SpaceX, what they're trying to do, or with this launch, what they're trying to do is get the SpaceX booster, the upper stage, to do as much of the work as possible. And what it's going to do is launch into a highly eccentric orbit, similar to geostationary transfer orbit, but with an apoapse or an apogee all the way out at about 270,000 kilometers. So that's almost at the moon, but not quite. The perigee is still going to be in low Earth orbit. Now, if you compare this to a geostationary uh, insertion, a geostationary transfer orbit, they would normally boost the spacecraft up to uh, about 30, you know, geostationary altitude, and then the spacecraft would need about one kilometer per second of delta V to actually put it into a circular orbit all on its own. Obviously, they're not doing that because they have a much smaller budget. Instead, what they're going to do is then over subsequent orbits, they're going to boost the apoapse outwards until they get close to the moon. And then they're going to get a gravity assist from the moon. And the gravity assist is going to raise the whole orbit, but it's also going to incline the orbit relative to the moon by about 37 degrees. So they're kicking it outwards and upwards in terms of inclination. And then they're going to... Uh, perform another few burns and the ultimate orbit will have an apogee roughly at 372,000 kilometers which is about the same as the moon and I think the perigee is going to be 108,000 kilometers and that will neatly put it on an orbit which has a period exactly half that of the moon. They will also have it so that when it is at apogee, when it is furthest from the earth, its orbit will be, it, it's, it will basically be at 90 degrees to the moon. So one time it'll get out, the moon will be 90 degrees behind it. The next time it comes out, it'll the moon will be 90 degrees ahead of it. So this is basically, this is what's called a COSI resonance. And it's, it's in a high inclination orbit with a an integer period relative to the moon. 
and it'll do some oscillations around a kind of mean. It'll stay pretty stable for you know at least the duration of the or of the mission and possibly up to 15 years. It will also keep it far away from the Earth so that it doesn't uh, doesn't end up having to worry about. Uh, you know, the Earth getting in the way, they're not going to have to worry about coming close to the Earth changing the temperature, and yet they will still come close enough to the Earth that at perigee they will be able to spend three hours beaming all the data they have collected on this particular orbit back to the Earth. So it's really a quite smart piece of engineering here, and it's not engineering in the traditional sense, it's mission design really, it's astrodynamic engineering, I, there, there's another word for this. But they've, by doing this, by making these, by coming up with this perfect orbit, they have been able to minimize the amount of fuel and engines required on the spacecraft and therefore been able to save money and put that into other important systems like, you know, cameras and telescopes and transmitters and everything. So, you know, this is an interest. I guess my point is that sometimes mission design is about as much about designing the orbits as it is about designing the spacecraft because saving on your delta v requirements can save you money all the way through the system so yeah i'm hoping that this all goes well because it will be the first object in this kind of orbit so yeah let's watch it today hope it flies safe mm -hmm.